As she said, my name is Iñaki. I'm here with Michael. We are uh, from the CKI team. Um, what do we do? The CKI team, also known as, known as continuous kernel integration, uh, we basically try to avoid grumpy kernels uh, developers for, for a living. Uh, we run CI for the Linux kernel, uh, which means that we grab a commit, we trigger a pipeline, we build the, commit, the kernel, we test it, and we try to report the results of what we just tested. That can't be too hard, right? Uh, well, some time ago, we started like this. Uh, it was basically a proof of concept. We needed to show that uh, testing the kernel on a continuous integration workflow was possible. So we sat down uh, besides a big behemoth of, of course, Jenkins, uh, because you can never go wrong by using Jenkins. But uh, that, that was really useful to, to show us uh, and people that testing the kernel was possible. But it involved a lot of uh, Python and uh, OpenShift projects and clicking and stuff that really didn't scale that well. So after showing that this was uh, something that was possible, that we could uh, maintain and uh, scale up testing of the kernel of the Linux kernel, we needed to revisit our problems. Uh, we started gaining more and more responsibilities. For example, with kernel developers, we needed to onboard new kernel trees. We started testing uh, kernels from Brew and Koji, which are uh, some builders uh, that uh, Red Hat and Fedora uses. We also test Git repos. We are now testing GitLab merge requests. We have a patchwork, which is an interface for mailing lists and the patches sent to the mailing lists. Uh, we also provide uh, gating for RPM packaging. And we are working on the kernel workflow infrastructure. I don't know if uh, you've seen any of those talks. It's really interesting change on how Red Hat works on the kernel. But we also... Uh, work with test maintainers. We help them onboard new kernel trees. We help them onboard uh, new tests. Uh, I also configure target testings and well, give them some feedback about how those tests are going. So we need it to be somewhere like this, where everything is automatic, everything is on track. We don't have to go clicking buttons and putting cars back on the trucks. Um, but yeah, it's really not that easy. Um, so we uh, decided, I mean, we found out that we were going to need some uh, fuzzy keywords like software, re site reliability, reliability, engineering, and things that help us keep our machinery working. Um, we started building our services under this main lemma, that is that any component or dependency that can fail will fail, and some of them will fail even more than others. But we needed to make sure that all the failures can be retried successfully. Um, and if, I mean, if there are some that cannot be retried, we need to know which ones are and try to keep them as minimum. So all the failures at first need to be prevented. <clears throat> Having fewer components or simple dependencies helps us prevent important uh, issues. But also, once uh, the failures happened, those need to be detected, and we need to recover from that. Um, what some background about what we have. Uh, basically, we run on a lot of different infrastructures outside of our control, like uh, different OpenShift clusters. Uh, Beaker clusters, Beaker is a uh, hardware provisioning, so that's how we, what we use to get machines for the testing. But we also run on AWS, on GitLab.com, and many other platforms. To communicate all these services running on different uh, platforms, we use AMQP cluster, uh, which is uh, well, RabbitMQ, uh, and uh, a lot of queues to connect all the services. We also have internal microservices running on all these different clouds, like uh, services to trigger the pipelines, uh, to send the reports, to, to, to babysit the pipelines until they finish. But we also have like uh, really important pipeline components, like the GitLab runner, which we use to run the tests, a test database where we store all the, all the results and information that we generate, uh, the bigger provisioning, etc. 
So the first thing is how to prevent uh, these problems from happening at the beginning. <clears throat> well, basically minimize the essential pieces. If you have less critical pieces, that means that less things can go wrong. Uh, we divided our all our stack into three main categories. Essential components are the pieces that are needed for the service to run, are our single points of failure, and are the things that we need to keep at minimum. On the next layer, we have the necessary components. Are those things that need to run at least some time for the operations to work? Like, for example, the reporter component, you don't need it to have it running all the time with the uh, four nines or nine nines. We just, uh, as long as it's running sometimes and it can pick up the work uh, that it was uh, generated before, that's not a problem for the operation. But we also have like optional components which are those that provide observability and increase the reliability of the system. We cannot fail our testing if, for example, the logs aggregation system is down or the, all the metrics or stuff like that. The first minimization we made are the message queues. We tried to decouple all the pieces of code. Uh, for that, we translated all the REST APIs into message queuing. Uh, and that allows us to run all this, like to be abstracted from the place that the code is running as long as it can connect to the RabbitMQ server. That uh, turns everything into a way more reliable and distributed system. Increase, as I said, the service portability because uh, you are not tied to the place that the, the code is running as long as it can connect to the message queue. Uh, and it allows us to automatically reprocess the failed messages after some time. Uh, we built a system on RabbitMQ, vanilla RabbitMQ, uh, that allows us to uh, retry the, mess the messages that failed after some time. By default, if you if a, a worker returns the message to the um, server, the, that message would get on the beginning of the, of the queue, so it would get automatically reprocessed the next time, like right after it was returned. And that could bl can block your services if something is going on with that particular message. In this case, the message goes to the back of the queue and gets reprocessed after some time. For example, uh, as I said, well, we have uh, this uh, RabbitMQ cluster. It's uh, hosted on AWS as it's one of the, our key components. We need to make sure that it runs with as much as availability as possible. Uh, we have a webhook bridge for those applications where we cannot decide if they, are, they have REST APIs or use message queues we built a very uh, reliable bridge to turn webhooks into message queues, into messages in the queues. Uh, and for the retries, we, we also have, a, we are converting external message queues like uh, UMB, which is an in internal Red Hat uh, message bus, or Fedora message bus into our own message we, where we can retry the, the, the messages successfully. Another example are the S3 buckets. Uh, the, this provides a very generic way to store artifacts. We don't need to rely on, on NFS volumes or Git hosting or other platforms that we, we were using before. Uh, S3, it's uh, universal, it's fast, and it's really reliable. So we use AWS S3 for external files. We use OpenShift and Mini.io for internal files. Um, it can also be used as a poor man's database. We also use it to store some files and to distribute the status across some pieces. And again, it increases a lot of the service portability because you don't need to, you don't care where it's where it's running. You don't like, for example, with an NFS volume, you need you would need to mount that volume on all the places you want to use it. With with S3, as long as you have access to the server, uh, it's all fine. For example, we use this as uh, Ccache uh, for caching Git repositories, so we don't clone all the kernel trees every time for pipeline artifacts and uh, as the database, as I said, for configurations on some static files. The third thing is containers. We try to turn everything into container. Uh, this allows us to forget about the infrastructure, don't worry where the things are running, just uh, uh, we distribute the packages like this. We don't install packages, just put them into an image and use the image everywhere we need to use it. Like, for example, 
we use AWS Lambda for the webhook bridge, but we also use GitLab runners and we don't care what it's running. We can run the runners on GitLab, or oh, sorry, on Docker or Kubernetes or some disposable machines. We don't care about that. The next thing <clears throat> is detection. Uh, we have, as we said, uh, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of moving pieces. Uh, we build and test uh, pipelines. We have microservices. We have cron jobs. Everything running on AWS, OpenStack, different Kubernetes clusters. So we need to log and monitor all these these things running. For the logs, we tried to pipe everything to DevNull, but that didn't solve our problems. So we had to improve this. We found out that Loki was a really good solution for it. Uh, it's basically like a Prometheus, but for logs, it helps us index the logs and uh, have easy retention policies for or the logs to be rotated easily. For the metrics, uh, Prometheus is an excellent, it's so good that we realize that every application deserves a slash metric endpoint. It allows you to monitor the internal styles of the services. Uh, you can know what is uh, how a service is doing, how long is it taking. And uh, for our Python applications, most of our code is Python. So using Python client, a Prometheus client, it's really important for get solution. It handles everything. You just need to define the, the data you want to expose. Everything it's visualized on Grafana. We have dashboards like this, which allows us to see what's going on and have some alerts if something goes wrong. And uh, at a higher level, we use Monit. Monit is a simple solution for monitoring. You can write your own uh, shell scripts and make them fail, and Monit will, will uh, alert you about that. But it also has some basic, really useful checks like uh, hosts, uptime, uh, file systems uh, size and capacity. But we also, like as I said, with our custom scripts, we check for bigger host queues. S3 bucket sizes and RabbitMQ uh, queues size and the not acknowledged messages. This is really important to also record all these problems because you, as you can see here, we can have a good track of what happened and when. And uh, like at, at last, if everything explodes, you want to be the first one to, to know when something goes wrong. So we use Sentry, which uh, capture, which uh, yeah, catches all the, the problems in our code, and we can have some nice trace tracebacks and uh, be aware of what's going on with our applications. We use Sentry.io for that and an internal instance for the internal code. Uh, all these, it's not really useful if you don't have alerting. So we have uh, all these uh, low-key Prometheus and uh, Monit things go into IRC, which is our main channel of communication, but also are sent to the mailing list uh, if anyone reads that. But it's the most important thing, it's the IRC because it's where we spend all our time. But the thing is that even after you realize that something went wrong, went wrong you need to recover from that. So we have uh, on, the on the most basic level, the, 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 the worst problem is the network always as that cat was uh, afraid of. Uh, we have a lot of network issues. So we we added retry loops to every network access in the pipeline and on the, all the services. So we know that any transient network failure is retried several times. But we also uh, used, as I said, uh, the requeuing of uh, messages in RabbitMQ. Uh, there's uh, some information on our blog about this system, but basically we just uh, requeue all the messages indefinitely because uh, as it says, nothing is as motivating to fix a bug as a message full, as a queue full of messages. Um, with all the alerting, we get alerts every time a message fails. So it's really easy to, I mean, it's great. So you don't lose the failures. You can retry the failures. You can go you go and uh, test locally with that message that it's ma ma uh, making stuff fail. Um, so it's really helpful. And the third, uh, when all these things went wrong and uh, didn't catch the problems on time, we have the pipeline herder, which is uh, a bot that uh, babysits the pipelines. And if something failed, it, ha it knows about many failures that we know we can safely retry. 
So it goes and checks the logs of the of the jobs and it retries them for us so we don't have to click anything. If that's not enough, we have fail, fallbacks. As I said, we have different uh, clusters. We have different OpenShift clusters. Uh, so we can change the runners. If something goes wrong on one of the clusters we are running, we can fall back to the others really easily with just pushing a button. So Michael is going to tell us how we try to do DevOps. That was, that was a good introduction. Uh so uh Yaki talked about the the aspect of um how, how we keep it running but now uh the system would be the most stable if we don't change it so um i i need to say next slide in yaki doer <laughs> so we we thought about how how to approach actually um our, our devops uh, culture and so uh, and Steph Walters also talked about this a lot now in the last last couple of years. Um, it, I really made those things up here, but um, one one aspect we consider pretty important is that it is as open as possible. So uh, this is about code, about documentation, about how we work, uh, about communication. But it also needs to be safe. So everybody is scared of certain pieces of code, and we try to minimize them um, so that. If you change something or if you have to change something, you feel safe um, and are more or less also eager to clean up pieces um, as it as it becomes apparent. And the third piece is that that deployments need to be painless. Uh, production deployments, but also deployments locally, even if it's not really deploying, but just running the code yourself, just just for figuring out whether it should work. Um, but also going into like staging and canary uh, deployments that uh, might be hard to do if you don't have a lot of ex experience uh, in a certain area of the code. So I think the next slide starts with the openness aspect. So uh, openness in our case uh, means of course open code. Uh, we have a lot of repositories um, for all these pieces. We try to consolidate them where it makes sense, but still, still it's a lot. Uh, and the open by default is, is actually something we try to live by. Now, there are certain pieces that we are not really comfortable putting them, for example, in gitlab.com, uh, mostly secrets, uh, internal documentation configuration. Um, our deployment YAMLs are still internal. Uh, that uh, is something that we want to, to change. Um, also the Ansible code, we've, we've learned a lot from what the Fedora infrastructure people put online. And we want to do this, but um, at the moment, there's still this encrypted secrets file on there um, where we don't want to just have a password between our internal infrastructure and, um, uh, and the world. So this, this piece is uh, in progress. We've worked a lot of, on documentation and there's, there's far more to do, um, trying to find out what our audiences are. Um, we are a service, so we actually have users. Uh, kernel developers that are more or less forced to, to work with us, uh, we want to make that as painless as possible. Um, but we also want to document uh, the individual pieces. Uh, there are readme files, or there should be readme files on all of those repositories. Uh, and something we've, we've worked on is, is trying to inventorize how all these pieces uh, fit together. We've shown that from CE, and I will show an example in a minute. Um, and again, we, we still have internal documentation, um, so um, we are not there yet. So this is, this is, uh, oh yeah, wait, ha, there's one other point. Um, and yeah, one, one of the things that, that worked well is having documentation Fridays so that there's actually an excuse to work on documentation. So this is an example of, um, of what uh, the inventory looks like. It tries to describe a service uh, or a cron job in this case, what it's good for, where you can find uh, the code, uh, where you can find the deployment, what it depends on, um, what other pieces might depend on it. And uh, this gets rendered on in our website. Um, so in the next slide, you see an example of what this looks like on our homepage um, so that you can actually start to explore stuff. You can click through. The idea is also to, to use that, for example, for monitoring so that you can define in this uh, structured YAML format uh, your monitoring or even alerting um, a connection between um, deployment and, and code uh, and put more metadata about how it all fits together in an abstract uh, way let's say but uh still um should make it easier to to get a feeling how it all fits together 
we try to be open in our uh, daily operations. Um, that means uh, moving issues from Jira to, to GitLab.com, um, which is also quite a bit nicer um, for, for the features we only use from Jira, which are really nicely covered by, by GitLab.com. We have an open channel that's mostly populated uh, by the bot that is alerting about everything, um, but also all the discussions happen there. Uh, everything is merge request, merge request based, so there are no direct pushes um, and everybody can basically subscribe to, to the merge request or the projects and, and uh, chime in. We try to uh, formalize our feedback process a bit because sometimes uh, discussions happen in IRC and you might not be online, so you might miss them. So for for more general stuff, uh, we had might be a good idea or where you just feel you want to have feedback. Um, we have an RFC process, which basically means you put up a merge request to the documentation repository. On the next slide, there's an example, uh, and you can ask for feedback. It's still, uh, it's a feedback process explicitly. It's it's not, I mean, you have processes like ADR, uh, ar architectural decision records, um, where you actually ask for decisions. Uh, in this case, we are an agile team. We trust each other uh, well enough so that you can actually just um, ask for feedback and we trust that uh, whoever uh, put this up will do the right thing afterwards. So they are the domain expert. They they get feedback and then they can carry on whatever they want to do. Um, the next big chunk is safety. Uh, and in this case, uh, safety to change. So we want to make that as, as, as safe as possible. We want to make reviews as painless as possible. So that means linting and testing as much as you can. Uh, we try to lint shell code, shell in YAML code, uh, all kinds of Python linters that we can get our hands on, unit tests, um, markdown linting, uh, link checking, everything we can think of uh, to automate um, and also to, to have less to review because if it's, if it's automatically uh, linted, uh, there's already automated feedback coming. Um, means also we have a linting script that you can just run locally and which is work hopefully um, independent of your explicit Python setup. Um, you're still working on uh, using formatters. Uh, the pack packet team is uh, quite a bit better um, or like further along this trajectory. Uh, so using something as black for our Python code might actually take, take a pain out of the uh, formatting expect, let's say, instead of just using Flaygate, but that's the work in progress. Um, and one another aspect for the testing is that we, we these dependencies that, that we have shared libraries um, that are reused in other places. And so if somebody changes the library, we don't yet run dependent uh, testing pipelines. And so this is still on the list to do, but should also happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, as Inyaki already said, we, we split it up into, into microservices uh, also because um, I'm pretty old. I need to fit pieces into my head. Um, so I have the tendency to simplify things. Um, and that also makes it less scary because if you have a, the feeling or if you have a good understanding or at least you think you have a good understanding, it's it's much more fun to, to change code and to clean it up. And also, uh, in our experience, microservices are structured better. So there, there are some interfaces that you more or less need to either explicitly or implicitly define between those pieces and that actually uh, makes structures uh, more clear. What's on the next slide? I have no idea actually. Uh, oh yeah. So, and the last, last aspect is uh, how you can actually deploy code. So we are basically, um, it's always nice. So we say we are an agile team and that means for us uh, living on the edge. Um, so uh, if you merge something to main, it gets deployed one, or the, one way or the other. And the way that works for us is that you get a review, but you are responsible for, for merging it and for uh, actually making sure that any fallout is handled or to revert whatever you changed. So it's your code. The reviewers can give feedback, uh, but they are not responsible for whatever you wrote. Um, so it's a process that's working quite well. Um, it's very important to have some some uh, restraint at the end of the day uh, or be just before the weekend. And it's a good idea to to uh, shift the deployment to the next day or to next week. And Yaki already uh, discussed um, the structure of what we have. And now for deployment, there are the, the last two um, types of, uh, of stuff we run. So internal microservices and, uh, and pipeline components. And they are slightly different in how you can deploy them. 
So um, for microservices, those are containers. Um, we package them up. They should be uh, policy free. Um, and code should be structured in a way that there is a non-production mode uh, that makes running the code um, safe. Like, for example, if you normally send emails, if you set this to false, uh, if production is false, it shouldn't send emails. Uh, otherwise, you get kernel developers yelling at you. Um, we centralized all our uh, deployment YAMLs uh, for OpenShift, all the Ansible uh, scripts into one piece um, that allowed us to actually clean it up uh, and get some structure in there, also to get an overview, what do you run? Um, and uh, as everything is deployed automatically from there, uh, if you change something, everything is, is redeployed. Uh, it's either important, Ansible, and in, in OpenShift or Kubernetes YAMLs, so they shouldn't, shouldn't mess things up. But it also means that uh, it should work. So um, if uh, the deployment code is brittle, you will notice because it runs quite often. Um, and also keeps people from messing with the infrastructure in a manual way because basically their changes get overwritten the next time such a pipeline runs. Um, now, normally you, for a microservice, you want to try it locally. We have a helper to build this container image. You can also just pull it down from a merge request. Uh, all our merge requests built all of those container images uh, continuously, you get, get them tagged per merge request, you get them tagged per pipeline. So whatever you are interested in, you can get from, from GitLab, uh, from the registry, uh, registry there, might be faster than building it locally. Now, if you want to run those uh, container images, that is always painful because you need to have some configuration on them to make them do what you want. Most of the pieces have a command line interface that actually allow you to check the microservice, uh, how it processes some cert uh, a certain aspect. For example, for the kernel webhooks, um, they, they check merge requests, whether they have uh, certain label sets, stuff like that. Um, and so they have a command line interface to basically uh, check a certain merge request, for example, and you can see what they do. Um, so if you would think of a function as a service, um, most of our microservices are mostly event processing, so you can basically do one shot uh, run on, on some event, uh, cloud event, something. Um, but so, yeah, it, it works reasonably well, but uh, getting them up uh, locally is, is a bit of a pain because you need to have this configuration and it's not something that you can easily share because there might be some production credentials in there. Um, for the next aspect is uh, actually how do you, can, can you actually do a testing deployment of them. Now you have this non-production mode. So either you run it locally in this non-production mode or, or remotely on a Kubernetes cluster, doesn't matter. So you can just uh, move it there. Um, there's a shell script that nobody runs because it's painful uh, to run a shell script. Um, and uh, so the last thing we've worked on is basically making that uh, automated by the press of a button in GitLab. So you have a merge request, you have this beautiful button that says uh, deploy it into a merge request environment and it just spin up uh, a comparable uh, deployment config in, in OpenShift or Kubernetes uh, to try it out. And okay, the idea is that you can find a link and, and then inspect the logs, for example. Um, same goes for production deployments. Normally it's, it's deployed automatically when the merge request is merged, but if you want so, sometimes to, to find out whether something is really fixed on, on your code. Uh, you can also deploy a merge request into production, and that will survive a redeployment of this deployment repository. Basically, it takes a container image as being production, and within two minutes, it should just uh, appear on OpenShift, and you can actually figure out whether you solved the problem. Or you can press another button in another job to roll back, which should also be uh, quite painless and within a couple of minutes. Now, for the other big piece, which is the pipeline. So this is, uh, the pipeline is always a nice word, but it's, it's basically um, a lot of Python tools uh, duct taped together uh, by a lot of bash, you know, 2000 lines of bash, I think at the moment, which is really hard to test, but you can test the components. It's actually the way you should test them. Uh, they all have a command line interface. You pip install them uh, and there you go. Um, and that is actually the way these tools are also developed. For um, actually running the pipeline itself, we, we support canary deployments. So uh, for all the, that's on the next slide, um, you can um, run your non-merged code um, in a pipeline. 
So basically, normally these pipelines, uh, these are just container images, they, they do a pip install in the beginning uh, of the main branch. And you can override it to say, like, I want to have uh, my branch instead of the main branch. Um, and we have a bot that will help you. And if you're nice, uh, you can ask it a lot of complicated questions, uh, basically saying, like, test uh, this old pipeline that passed a while ago, use the same uh, kernel revision. Uh, it should still pass. Um, but, and you can modify um, also parameters if it's necessary for, for testing your changes. If you, for example, mess with the pipe, uh, the pipeline YAML, but also, for example, if you, for example, um, change how the beaker provisioning works, you can actually figure out whether you you broke the production setup before before it gets merged. Yeah. Okay. And then, then production deployment is is for the pipeline. Basically, you merge it, you get it uh, as soon as it hits the Git repository. It will be used for the next pipeline that comes along. And if you need to revert code, it's it's a git revert and uh, and a button press away. So that's that's also quite easy um, as well. 